Hey everyone, welcome back to Power Electronics. Today we're talking about losses. And the way we did it last time was we kind of broke down capacitors, right? I'm going to look at each element and study how they contribute to total loss in a converter. Today we're talking about inductors. So I assume all of you are familiar with inductors or what an inductor is. This is the circuit symbol, right? This weird bumpy line has value L, impedance J omega L, right? Pretty standard stuff. This is an idealized element, right? Purely inductive. However, when you go to actually make such an inductor, you have to use real materials. And real materials are not ideal. And when you build it, you end up getting some non ideality, some parasitics. So let's look how you might construct an inductor. Right? So Maybe first off, let's, let's use blue. First off, I mean, the, the first thing that we think about is really maybe a solenoid when we think of an inductor. And a solenoid is really just a coil, right? A lo many loops of wire. Really anything can be an inductor, right? You can just have a single piece of wire that has inductance. But if you want to control the inductance, then you can construct it in a particular way. The solenoid is kind of one of the easiest ways to understand how an inductor works, right? So each of these loops of wire contributes some field on the interior of the wire, and the more field, the more energy you can store in magnetic fields, basically the more inductance you have. So with this coil, there are a few parameters we're interested in. One is the length, the length of this coil. The other is how many turns, which we refer to as n, how many turns, how many loops of wire there are in the solenoid. And the third thing we're interested in is the cross-sectional area. And now we assume that this is like a, uh, a cylinder, basically, or at least that's what I'm doing here. I'm assuming this is a cylinder. Additionally, you can add materials inside this loop to increase the inductance. And you, you don't have to add anything, but you can add something if you if you want. And the material the material you choose, the type of material you choose, has a strong impact on the properties of this of this solenoid, right? So this is what we call the core, and the core has some magnetic permeability, mu r, and of course free space has permeability mu naught. And when you construct this thing, it turns out that the resulting inductance is equal to mu r mu naught n squared a over l. Right? This is like the the ideal solenoid equation, or the equation for the inductance of a solenoid. Right? So it's proportional to the relative permeability. So if you choose something with higher permeability, you can increase the inductance proportional to the square of the turns, right, that comes out in, in the equations, basically, the more turns you add, the higher the inductance you're going to be, you're going to get, the more area there is, the higher the inductance, and the longer it is, the lower the inductance. So there are several core materials you could use. So I, I mentioned before that you can have an air core inductor, you can have an iron core inductor, right, iron is kind of like the what you think of when you think of magnetic things. You can have a ferrite inductor, ferrite core. Maybe I can stop writing core because they're all cores. Uh, you can have a ceramic. You can have laminated steel and people often laminate uh, metallic cores to reduce eddy currents. We'll get into that a little bit later. And you can also have an iron powder core. And basically, the choice of core material strongly affects the performance of the inductor and what it can be used for. So considering this, I mean, even just with this simple model, we can kind of construct a slightly more complex uh, circuit model. And by slightly, I mean very slightly. So the model we're going to think about, well, one, we have wire. Wire has finite conductivity. I mean, copper has finite conductivity, which means that you're going to have some resistance. And again, we refer to this resistance as 
the equivalent series resistance, or the DCR, as some manufacturers refer to it. And it, yeah, it's it's a resistor which is in series with your inductance, right? So this is like a lumped element model. And there's another there's another uh, parasitic element that occurs in capacitors, and it affects the frequency performance. And that's the fact that these coils of wire are basically conductors that are in close proximity to one another. If you have conductors in close proximity to one another, you basically have a capacitor. So between each of these windings, you actually have a capacitance, right? Every single one of them, from winding to winding or interwinding, you have a capacitance. And as a result, when you add all these together, you end up getting one total C, which we'll put in parallel with uh, this device, right? So this is like the uh, C inter, and I'll call this, uh, this is the interwinding capacitance. And you'll notice that, again, as similar to the cap, we have an L and a C, which means when we group them together, when we group these things together, we have some kind of resonant tank, which means we have some resonance or resonant frequency, and it's known as a self-resonant frequency. And I think you can imagine what this is referring to since we talked about it the last time, but yeah, it's when it's the point at which these impedances are equal and opposite and the impedance cancels out. And eventually beyond that point, this inductor looks more like a capacitor, right? Similar to how a cap at, at some point, the, cap, the cap looks more like an inductor in this, it looks more like a cap. Cool. So, I mean, this basic model really just like highlights one of the, one of the primary losses in inductors, and that is conduction loss. All right, this is a very large contributor to loss typically. I mean, core losses as well, but conduction loss is pretty straightforward. It's easy to calculate, and it gives you a good, good idea of how well your inductor is going, going to perform. All right, so it's pretty simple. I'll call this P conduction L. It's I squared R, right? And again, because this is a resistor, the power loss across it is related to, we're using time varying signals, right? So we're looking at the square of the RMS current times the ESR or the DCR, whatever you want to say, right? And that this is a pretty good model for, you know, conduction loss. However, there are other losses. This is not the only kind of loss. And... The other kind of loss is really quite complex. So the other kind is called, or is referred to as core loss. The other primary loss in inductors. And core loss, as you can tell, has to do with the core. And there's kind of two primary uh, components to it. One is eddy current losses. So what are eddy currents? Imagine you have some kind of core material. And you force some magnetic flux through it. Well, according to Maxwell's equations, this flux should result in current flowing perpendicular to the to the flux lines, right? I mean, you can think about Ampere's law if you want, right? If you have some current flowing, then you produce some uh, magnetic field, vice versa. If you have some magnetic field, then you induce some current. And when the current flows in the 
magnetic material in the core material, we refer to that as we refer to those currents as eddy currents. And as this current flows, the material has some finite conductivity, right? So it results basically in resistive loss. So eddy currents are really currents induced by the magnetic field inside the core material. Right, so you can imagine that there's like there is wire, like there's wire around this core material that's inducing this flux, but the flux also happens to induce some current inside the core material itself. So often what people will do to overcome this is they'll reduce the path that the eddy current fl can flow. So people do this with laminations for, let's say, steel cores. Like Remember, one possible core is a laminated steel core. The laminations are there to reduce eddy current losses. And you can use like ferrites or some kind of powdered cores, right, to kind of decrease the domain size or the, the range where this current can flow. Again, I won't get too deep into this because it's actually relatively complex to calculate this explicitly, but the, the idea, you, sh you should understand the idea. The second type of core loss is referred to as hysteresis loss or hysteretic loss. So hysteresis is this is a state dependent phenomenon or state dependent behavior. So what do I mean by that? Well, it, it re refers to the relationship between fl magnetic flux and magnetic field, right? So the common explanation is that inside a core material, there are many different magnetic domains or different areas with their own magnetic field pointing in some direction, right? So the materials kind of formed up of these little little areas and each of these areas has you know some magnetic field intrinsically pointing in some direction so on the whole it doesn't really look like it has any of its own magnetic field right if you look at the average of all these vectors typically it doesn't really point anywhere it kind of sums to a zero vector let's say however when you apply a field to this material, the domains tend to align through shifting, right? So they're like literally, I mean, the explanation is they're literally moving around to align themselves with the applied mag magnetic field. And that causes some, let's say, friction kind of losses, it produces heat. And eventually, a few a few phenomena happen, right? So one of them is that eventually all the domains line up. And that results in saturation. Right? So once the domains have all aligned with with the applied magnetic field, there's no more, let's say, resistance to the, to the field. And there's, you're not storing any extra energy by applying more field. So the flux saturates. The flux cannot get any higher than it is. The second thing is when you reverse the field, the domains don't 
return to their original state. Or they don't take the same path to get back to their original direction. It's kind of maybe more random. Which means the, the flux doesn't necessarily return to the same flux that you started at when you first applied the magnetic field H. And basically this results in a relationship between B and H that looks something like this. So this is the applied magnetic field H and this is a resulting magnetic flux B. So the drawing is this classic hysteresis curve. It looks like an S. And the core material defines a lot of these aspects of so how hard the saturation, how hard the, the material saturates, you know, where the saturation is, stuff like that. So this has some direction, right? You apply some positive H and it traces this path. And you apply and you reverse the direction of the H and it traces another path. And these are kind of the extremes of the B and H curve. But if you say by if you're operating around some current, then maybe the, what you trace out looks more like this, some smaller area within this wider BH curve, right? And there's loss associated with this because these domains are moving around. And the resulting loss is related to the area and the frequency. So the area of this curve, which is somehow related to the current or the flux and the frequency. Again, this is it's quite, coming up with an explicit equation is quite complicated and typically people just come up with empirical kind of answers. The way it's quantified typically is through what's known as Steinmetz equations. And this dude was our equation, Steinmetz equation. And this dude was a wizard, basically. Anyway, his empirical evidence through studying a bunch of things, he came up with a very specific equation where the P loss per unit volume, so this is like watts per centimeter cubed, let's say, some, some volume area, is equal to some parameter k times the frequency to some power alpha times the flux to some power beta. And k, alpha, and beta are the Steinmetz parameters. So these will be provided by a manufacturer if they don't have a loss calculator. This is for one frequency and it expects a sinusoidal waveform. So if the waveform you apply is in sinusoidal, then what this predicts is going to be very different. So this is like a predictor. Again, it's empirically derived. These these Steinmetz parameters, K, alpha, and beta, are empirically derived. So they vary depending on the core you're using, you know, the, the size of the core, or whatever. All, there's a lot of stuff involved. What I want to say is, this is complex. <laughs> and really, you're better off either use using a tool that some manufacturer might have, Coilcraft or Worth come to mind, to calculate core loss, or write a script. I mean, get these parameters from your, manuf from your manufacturer, write a script to calculate the loss, basically break down waveforms, let's say you have a triangular waveform or something, break it down into its frequency components and figure out the, the per unit volume loss from that. Here we're mostly going to focus on the conduction loss, although core loss can be significant. So let's calculate loss for an inductor. I'll put this in quotes. Right, so really this is just conduction loss that we're that we're finding. And what it comes down to, right, if you remember the loss is IRMS of the inductor squared times the ESR, the the DCR if you want to call it. 
So it comes down to finding the RMS of an inductor current. So let's look at the puck. Right, so I hope you remember what the buck inductor current looks like because it should be burned into your head at this point. Right, so it's two state, there's some average current with some ripple, right? It looks like a triangle, right? So this is IL and this is delta IL. Great. And this is IL of T. So our goal is to find the RMS. of I L of T. Well, the RMS is equal to the root of the mean of the square of the inductor current, right? That is literally what RMS stands for. And I challenge you to solve this for yourself, but you can also look it up in the back of a textbook like Fundamentals of Power Electronics, and it tells you that the RMS current for this waveform is equal to IL times root one plus one third delta IL over IL squared. That's it, right? Super simple. As a result, P loss for the buck, the inductor is equal to the square of this thing times the ESR, which is IL squared times one plus one over three times the ESR. And that's a good way to estimate the conduction loss for your inductor. Cool. So I wanted to show you some an example of using a tool. This, this is from Coilcraft actually. They have an online tool to allow you to calculate the core loss and conduction losses. This is just some inductor, actually a couple of inductors. So it's the XAL7070, 68.2. So this is a 6.8 uh, microfarad inductor, right? This is also 6.8 microfarad inductor. And they're both the XAL family and they just vary in size. So this is, I believe, 70, uh, seven millimeters by seven millimeters. And this is eight millimeters by eight millimeters. So this one is just a little bit bigger. And they assume basically some kind of buck inductor current, right? At duty is 50%, some average current. Here I've set it to be 10 amps. And the total losses for this are quite large. So 3,765 3, milliwatts for the 7070 and something a little bit less for the 8080. And this is kind of true. So like the this is kind of true in, in general. The larger the inductor, typically the lower loss you'll have. And that's probably because you can have slightly bigger wires, so the resistance will be lower. Maybe you have a slightly bigger core, so the saturation current saturation current's a little bit different. So in this case, the core loss in both in both inductors, the core loss and the conduction loss are about equal, right? So they're about equal contributors to the total loss of the inductor. And again, this is just something that you can calculate it for yourself, but it is much easier to go to the manufacturer and see if they have something that allows you to calculate it for your particular particular application. So here, one thing that's interesting is that as you approach higher and higher currents, the inductance decreases. And this makes sense. This is actually related to the saturation of the inductor core, right? So in some way, the slope of this uh, BH curve is actually related to inductance. So, or it's related to mu r really. The slope of this curve is actually related to mu r. And because we know that mu r, the magnetic permeability, is related to inductance, proportional to inductance, if mu r decreases, then the inductance should also decrease. So as you approach the saturation, the slope decreases, which means that the inductance should also decrease. So when you saturate, you're actually operating closer to the set to the flat part of the curve. Eventually you just read uh, eventually you approach the permeability of free space, right? When you completely saturate, it's like the core material isn't there anymore and the inductance decreases significantly. And that's exactly what we see. When we push the current for both of these, the inductance drops significantly. So it goes from 6.8 microhenries down to around 4.2. So it's not as drastic as the DC bias characteristics on ceramic capacitors, but it is still very important. 
And this decrease in inductance has a strong effect on the waveform of your inductor. So if the, if the inductance varies a lot, then what's going to happen is that your inductor current waveform will, will no longer be straight. It'll actually be curvy. So as the inductance decreases, the slope will increase of the inductor current. And you'll get these spiky waveforms that are no longer straight, they're curvy. And they'll do a lot of things. They'll actually increase conduction loss more. And they'll probably increase core loss more. So the core loss, the core loss equations will become less accurate because your waveform moves further and further away from the expected triangular waveform. Cool. So you can also look at the temperature rise. That's also important, right? You don't want your device to overheat. Eventually, if it overheats too much, it will fail. Temperature failure is also something here. And you can also look at uh, the total losses versus ripple current and frequency. And basically, as you increase the ripple current, again, you're going to approach satur saturation more. So you expect that your, one, your RMS current is going to go up, and two, you approach that saturation. So your loss is going to increase more. Here we notice again that the XAL7070, the smaller inductance, or the smaller inductor, has higher loss. And that's true also across frequency. And here's another inductor, a different inductor, or a family of inductors from Coilcraft. This is Coilcraft again. And uh, what I wanted to highlight here was this, was this uh, the variation across the inductor family. So basically it's the same package. These are all the same package, but they have different inductances. So it goes from 3.3 microhenries down to, or up to 33 microhenries. However, here the DC, the DCR, the ESR, the equivalent series resistance basically, is the same for all of them. So it's 2.3 milliohms, pretty small, right? However, if you go up to 100 amps, like it says you could do, right? This is, these inductors are used for up to 100 amps. The loss, right? Let's just say, let's just say it's 100 amps squared times 2.3 milliohms. That's still a huge amount of loss, right? So how many zeros is that? It's a lot. This is a <laughs> this is a significant amount of loss. So we we lose three, so we get twenty three watts of loss if we push this three point three microhenry inductor up to its maximum current. That's pretty huge. You 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 should hope that your output power is also very large. And they also show you the saturation current. So this is like how much the inductance is going to vary as you push the current. So it'll drop by ten percent when you get up to ninety five. For this 3.3 and it'll drop to 20 drop by 20 percent 104 and so on right and it also tells you how much the current will rise or how much the temperature of the device will rise depending on the current so this inductor will rise by 20 degrees celsius when you get up to 19 amps right and they're all like that that's really just related to the dcr so this basically the lower the inductance the higher the available current for the same package size and th this trend is, is kind of kind of holds right so the larger inductor, lower current. Smaller inductor, higher current. And these, and you can see the saturation curves here, right? As they reach their peak, the maximum current that they can handle, the inductance starts falling off because the core starts to saturate. Mu R tends to decrease, and the inductance as a result decreases. And this inductance is also frequency related. However, they don't go beyond the self-resonant frequency, right? So all of these. They specify the self-resonant frequency. Again, this is related to interwinding capacitance or whatever capacitance is associated with this package and the inductance, right? So the smaller the inductance, the higher the self-resonant frequency. The larger the inductance, the lower self-resonant frequency. So the package probably has a very similar kind of uh, parasitic capacitance, right? And it's the only thing that's varying is the inductance or maybe the core material, right? So they're, they're adjusting the core material, maybe the gap or how much ferrite is inside there. I'm not exactly sure what the core material is, but they're varying it to vary the inductance. Clearly there is more or higher mu R for the larger the inductor because the wire is clearly the same. Cool, so that's it for this lecture. Again, core losses very hard to calculate. Use some tools provided by companies which produce the inductors to figure what it figure out what that is. But you can you you can use simple I squared R losses to calculate conduction loss for inductors very easily. Cool. So next we're going to talk about switching loss. Thanks.